Hi, marketers. This is Dots, and welcome to the Marketing Leadership Podcast. With me here is Shama Haider, founder and CEO at Zen Media, and the biggest PR thought leader in the world. We will discuss why customer relations is the new public relations. I know you guys are ready. I'm so excited as well. So let's get into it. Shama, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you, Dots. That was a very, very gracious welcome. <laughs> No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I have quite a bit of questions to ask about who you are, your background and role. So I'll try to be very quick about it. But first, tell us your story, you know, um, your career story about yourself and how you've become, you know, to the point where you are right now. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks for asking that. You know, it's interesting because I think so much of, of life is, is luck. And I, I say that with, with a lot of earnestness and, uh, I think my life is, is no different in that many ways. I did luck into the career that I have today. And then you add to that, right? Follow your instincts and what I call and I've called like strategic serendipity. Then you have the yeah. energy and you add serendipity to it. And I really think we need both, both those factors to be very candid. I think so many times I listen to podcasts or, okay, to be honest, I read them. I'm a very fast reader, so I prefer transcripts than actually listening. But, you know, I hear people say, and they're like, oh, I had this great idea, and then I did this. And it's like, you know, for most people, there was an element of, of luck and walls. And so much of this stuff also makes sense retrospectively. Like, when I look back, mm. it all makes sense, right? But at the moment... It really didn't. And I want to say this because I think right now there's so many people out there struggling, honestly, to find that narrative for themselves, trying to figure out where am I going? Is marketing even the career for me? Because I talk to marketers. Yeah. I know that that's, yeah. that's worth thinking. So I just want to say that, that when I share my story, I do it with, with a lot of knowingness. Look, a lot of it is right time, right place. Right. So I did my thesis on Twitter when it had 2,000 users. Social media wasn't even a phrase. When you told people, you know, when I told people like, hey, I, you know, Twitter, they would, you know, they'd still, they'd look at that blue cartoon bird, which has now been replaced by the lovely X, of course, is, you know, they would say, what cartoon is that? It, yeah. It was, it was Twitter. <laughs> What's Twitter? Wow. Really, really early days. And so I think at that point, I had just finished grad school. I finished my thesis on Twitter. I was fascinated by this world of social media. I thought this is going to be a game changer. It's going to change how we market, how we communicate, how we connect with people around the world. Like I cannot think of a bigger shakeup than than this. Wow. And because, but it was so early that companies didn't. You know, it, it's not like when I got started. It's not like people were rushing in and saying, "That's great, let's do this." Right? So there's a lot of yeah, yeah. Is, um, and you and you still kind of have the sense of the internet as a fad. So social media is definitely a fad. And so, I mean, at that point, I think I had a good dose of naivety <laughs> and thinking like, okay, well, if people don't understand this yet, I'll just put up my own shingle, right? And that's really how I got my start was from academia and really yeah. feeling like this is going to change the world. Um, at least, you know, I mean, of course, this is, remember, this is pre, pre you know, Egypt um, revolution, it, it's pre all of these things, really different times before I took, yeah. before the even iPhone as we know it, before Airbnb, before. So it's like a completely different world. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's that's essentially how I got my start was just a lot of belief in doing that. If I was starting today, I don't think that that's, that would be my direction. But a lot of it is right time, right place. And then I kind of discovered this real passion for marketing and PR and communications and, and honestly just connecting people right and i found that i had a gift for kind of seeing what's next um and i have mm. very few gifts i'm very honest about this i'm not a multi-talented person you said you yeah. have four-year-old dots i have a four-year-old son a two and a half year old daughter and they don't even like me singing lullabies to them at night they're like eh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not like how bad do you have to be right where your kids are like would you please not sing to us um, in fact, I actually just called my mom was a lovely voice and put her on speaker because then that'll that'll do or daddy was an amazing voice. But it's, I'm not good at a lot of things. But I think very early on, I did. I was lucky enough to figure out what I was good at and then naive enough to double down on it. And really, then it's just been a matter of consistency. You know, people are still 
quote unquote discovering me, discovering Zen Media. We've been around for 16 years. Wow. Yeah, it's um you say you don't have you are not like hot shots like a 200 score iq score but what you have is very special and that's the ability to see into the future i personally consider myself to be such a person too i tell my people all the time like when i'm like 100 years old and dead you need to put in there the man who sees the future um you know that's because it's Sometimes when you're working on something and you don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now, it's a lonely road. And I'm sure you walk that lonely road. Uh, but now you have millions of followers online and they say, you know, it takes many decades, 16 years in your case, to become an overnight success. So I just wanted to reiterate that. And I guess I've seen someone like me who's got the, I, I call it the Joseph, the Josephic uh, uh, talent or the Josephic skill, the ability to see something where no other ones are seeing it. But I'd like to hone in about your your agency success as well. Like, could you tell us a bit about the story with your agency and how you've been able to succeed so much? I, I think I heard you say your uh, conversion rates for campaigns is like 81% or something like that. I can't remember what the exact KPI is. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I will say this. Look, when I started the company, it was me, right? It was like mm -hmm. the band of one and then we've grown. And so, I mean, the Zen of today is very different than the Zen of yesteryear. And the huge part of it, really 90% of it is is the team, right? And I say mm -hmm. time and all these other factors, but it's, it's just really good people uh, and smart people. I don't know if we do a good enough job, honestly, of telling our own story. And so it's interesting that you asked that. And the first thing I think about is, you know, it's, it's really smart people. One of the questions that I like to ask our clients, and I actually think this is a great question to ask your clients, is mm. what was the one unexpected benefit of working with us? Right? Because everyone hires you for the expected benefits. So Zen Media, we work, you know, we're, yeah. we are for B2B firms, a lot of middle market B2B companies, healthcare, insurance, tech, you name it. Like a lot of mm. complex companies. That sometimes sell what you would consider boring, right, things. We don't work with the sexiest brands in the world, but we work with oh, I see. potatoes brands, right? So it's when they come to us, it's usually like, hey, various things. You know, we're, we're going to market. We need this uh, X, Y, Z. Or our team is like two, three people, even really huge companies. And we need a driver. We need, you know, this these things set up. Or in other cases, it's more straightforward. Hey, we need to earn media. Or we we need PR, which is what we've really kind of gotten known for in the last few years. And to your point, mm. had viral campaigns and, and done really interesting, great work. So I think there's those elements. But, you know, asking this question has been really interesting. And again, I urge people listening to ask your clients this because it might open your eyes to something that you just because it's not expected. I mean, the question itself is, what is the one unexpected benefit of working with us? So there's the expected stuff. And the funny thing is we, we asked our clients this and they all kind of said the same thing, which was you know, that the unexpected benefit was how much, how fun it is, you say fun, but you know, to work with smart people who get it, right? And, so, mm. and I, I, I mean, I guess to, whenever you're in your shoes doing the things, you kind of take it for granted. I know for me, it's like yeah. you work with really smart people. I love my team. I hope I don't take them for granted. But this idea, like, I don't, I don't think we go around waving that flag of, hey, we're X, you know, Snapchat and, and X CIA and X Palantir and X Bank of America. Like, but our team, yeah, yeah. Katie Listley Smart has great pedigree. Um, and so it was just interesting that clients picked up on that right away, though, right? And so I think it's a good question to ask your customers. It's that unexpected benefit. And it might open doors that you didn't, you didn't think about. Yeah, yeah. And it might even... Um create some other opportunities or now you, you run your go-to-market strategy or strategy in general. Um, I know you focus on B2B, but what you're saying could also be applied to B2C as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, 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 that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so to get into uh, the topic here now, I, we stalk our guests a lot. I, I don't know if you noticed that. And um, I saw in one of your keynotes that you mentioned that, marketers are obsessed more on the numbers versus the people and what we're supposed to do is you're supposed to obsess on the people you know compared to the numbers 
where do you see this going you know in terms of a branding campaigns pr campaigns do you think marketers marketing leaders are beginning to obsess more of uh, over people than with numbers and you could also answer that question in the context of your your research you you, you did um, conduct uh, a consumer research with the university so maybe if you could answer their question in that context and see uh, what those learnings are and if that was able to answer the question of having marketers obsess more over people than on the numbers. Yeah, so I'll break that down for you dots in two categories. And let me just say, yeah, thank you so much for asking great questions. I've probably done thousands of podcasts at this point, and uh, I am sincerely you know, appreciative when someone does their homework, right? <laughs> it's a big deal because it's like if you're going to take people's time then it's nice to give them something. And I try to think about that as a guest when I'm do when I'm even speaking and answering things. Funny, because we train our clients, right? The media training part of what we do and say, yeah, listen, yeah, yeah. take the question, but make sure that however you're providing value back, right? So I just want to take a, a, a like a little bookmark and say, thank you. I really appreciate you doing your own work. And I think it makes for a better experience across the board for someone as a guest, for the listeners. And really at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's you listening at home, watching Absolutely. other however you're, you're, you're listening. And so I, I do want to say that, you know, I never take it for granted people's time and attention when it's so scarce. Like hmm. anybody listening right now, I may never meet you. I may never see you. Yeah. But I just want to say I have such gratitude in my heart for you every night when I go to bed thinking there are people out there who could be doing a million things right now, but you're here taking your time. You're such valuable attention listening to this. So I just want to say thank you across the board and, and how meaningful that is uh, for me. Absolutely. Don't get to see it enough. Um, Thank you. To answer your question, yes. So there's two things that I kind of talk about and, and say, and I'll tie it into my research. You know, there's mm-hmm. most of the people don't focus on the measurable at the cost of the meaningful. And, and what that means is so many times we chase these numbers because these numbers are what we think leadership wants. They're, they're yeah. hollow. A lot of times they're just hollow. You know, because marketing, I think, still comes. There used to be a time, day and age, where it was really hard to get people's contact information, to get someone's email, to reach. Like, that was a big deal. So that was marketing's job for a long time. Getting yeah. this person's information. That today is a joke. Getting someone's information means nothing. Right? It's still, like, it's funny because... Even now we've clients, um, let's say prospects with folks who come to us and they're like, oh, you know, I want, I want more LinkedIn followers, right? And you, you have a lot, you see some of your clients are killing it on LinkedIn. How do I get more followers? I'm like, get mm-hmm. your followers, no problem, right? Like <laughs> you can have thousands and thousands of people, but you don't want, at the end of the day, it's not actually what you want. What you want is qualified people, your audience who's actually interested in your message. That's what you want. So it is a numbers game and it isn't. And so I just think the last kind of decade because of Facebook and Google and how much money yeah. thrown at things and they kind of gave everybody this answer, right? Like, oh, the old adage is half my marketing works. I just don't know which half, blah, blah, blah. It's like kind of the, the joke in marketing. So here come performance marketers, terrible, great branding, by the way, very untrue. Mm-hmm. So this, it's advertising. So many people think advertising is marketing. It's not. Subsec. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's, not, yeah. it's, not, it's not marketing. It's just, and so you got people conditioned to saying, oh, clicks, clicks. I can track clicks. And now we have cookies. And now I can tell you how many people. So it really became this measurable game without pausing to say, but is this meaningful? Right? Is this just because we get all these leads, are we converting them? Are we wasting time? We have these bloated sales departments. This has been an interesting year because I think it's had forced people to take a hard look at their organization and say, where do yeah. we need to lean out? Where do we need to clean up? Where do we need to double down? Right? So I think those three questions are really important to ask yourself. Where do you lean out? Where do you double down? What do you clean up? And sometimes you need someone, an outsider. We do this a lot. We go into clients, they say, yeah. let's do it. We help them figure it out. But it's important to ask these questions. So I think there's that aspect. And then what you were alluding to was my research that I did when I was in grad school, where I looked at why people use social media, any platforms. And people always think, oh, yeah. it's for sense of community. It's to connect. It's... I thought that too, but I was wrong. It's the secondary reason people use social media. The primary reason people use social media is to showcase their own identity. And mm. It's a really important question to ask because, you know, people do brand building exercises and they always do like, 
what does our brand say about us and what do we want to be known for? But a much better question you should be asking is, what does doing business with us allow our customers to say about their brand? It's true for B2C, it's true for B2B, it's true for everyone. You know, buying mm. from me, engaging with me, what does it allow my customer to say about themselves? And it's so funny because in B2B, right, the motivation yeah. is so different. And it's just, people say B2B is B2C, it's all the same. Oh, there's a marketer. I think B2C is easier. <laughs> and so mm, one of the reasons yeah. we chose B2B is because it takes, when we have B2C clients, honestly, the team loves it. It's fun. And it's because it's so much easier than when you're selling, you know, to enterprise tech and our clients have, you know, big ticket items or whatever. Different sales process, entirely different. But the motivator is different because in B2B, the motivator is you're trying to avoid blame. In B2C, mm. you avoid regret. Can you buy those shoes? Mm. And tomorrow you're like, ah, should I have bought those shoes? Or, you know, I just got my, an, an iPhone. Should I have waited, right, a couple more months to get the new iPhone? Like that, we're trying to avoid that feeling. In B2B, yeah. you're trying to avoid blame. I mean, even if you are top dog, you, you, it's a little bit different because it's your it's your job on the line, right? It's it's kind yeah, of yeah. You report to the board you anyway. Report to someone, even CEOs, you shareholders. You have someone you're reporting to. So the decision is not this is how I feel. It's how you're perceived. It's a lot of things, and so this is why trust becomes so important in B two B. That's why PR is so important in B two B. And these things that are meaningful, they're not really just easily measurable things. I mean, let's be very yeah. honest. But they're yeah. meaningful in that literally, you know, the old adage used to be that um, no one ever got fired for hiring IBM. Now, this was years and years ago. But the reason Whoa, people... I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a really, it's an old, old adage. And so sometimes they're writing people and they know, they know because they've heard it. But it was nobody got fired for hiring IBM. And it was, it didn't matter if they were the best or not. What mattered was that your boss couldn't say that you didn't bring the best, right? So you could just be like, hey, I went out and got the best. So, you know, like if, so it's in many ways, it is, it is CYA, right? Cover your ass, B2B, like it, it, it people, like especially that's why you have committees. That's why these things, because nobody wants to really have that fall on them. And so that's why. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's skill for now. So it's strategy season too. Yeah. So it's like, you know, who you're working with is not just who's good at the job. Because so many times we do have clients and they say, you know, Shama, I'm, I'm so good. We're so good. Don't understand the big guys. You know, there are some David Goliath type situations. They say, you've got yeah, enterprise yeah. companies we go up against and they're good, but our team is so much better. I mean, we do such great work. Our clients love us. And, and I explain to them, and so it's not the work. It's not just the work. It's the perception of the work. The reason yeah, people still yeah. pay the big bucks to these huge consulting companies and these big names is because of perception. And perception is what sells. So, to mold perception, though, it's a meaningful activity. It's not ne- necessarily an easily measurable activity. That's a very long-winded yeah. answer <laughs> to your. No, 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 no. It's I. I've I've got some very nice points. To be honest, I I think some of the things I've learned is that you know, of course, I've been in the marketing game thirteen years, and um, I look forward directly to people like you because you have a co- you have a lot of things that are common to what I do. For example, we've talked about the Joseph talent in seeing the future but there's also the fact that when it comes to demand generation for b2b you look at the two sides many people nowadays and you probably know a lot of them in the performance marketing space they deal with the performance marketing side of of b2b but you look at brand and you look at performance marketing which is really really very nice but one of the things you said also that caught my attention is the online identity uh, it's in your book uh companies that fail to ignore their online identity. So does that mean they are failing at preventing regret, that feeling of regret with customers for the B2C and, um, the, you know, pre- uh, they are failing to prevent blame for the B2B uh, side of things. Would you say is the reason why they fail or what are some of the other reasons? Yeah, I, I don't know if those two things are directly uh, connected. They might be correlated, right? In the sense that mm-hmm. B2B, you know, it's it's the buyer side. So you're talking about buyer side. And if mm-hmm. a company, let's say, fails, read that strong reputation, that perception, what happens is, yes, they will lose B2B business because 
you're not the trusted go-to in their space. It doesn't matter how good they are. It's the perception mm. of it. And I think that's what mm. you know, people really need to realize. If you're not being out there, if you're not, if you're not projecting that, if you're not molding and telling your story and cultivating that, then yeah, I mean, you're setting yourself up for, um, for a loss. I also think it's interesting that you're opening up yourself to competition. You know, I, I get mm -hmm. yeah. clients right now that we have that really think about it differently. They're so smart because they're, you know, they say, Shema, we're, we're top dogs now, right? But we want to make sure that we stay top dogs and we stay relevant for tomorrow. And so in some ways, that's thinking about your legacy and like, what do you want tomorrow to hold? Which is very different than, hey, what do I want to, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not the quick, it's, it's the what is what is going to keep us there tomorrow because we're getting new entrants. I mean, that, I think yeah. that's something that's not talked about enough is how much the competitive landscape has changed. And so the last, I would say like early noughties to 2015, 16 era even, you had arbitrage. Like you could get in front of audience, you could, you could spend less money and get so much more. And that's just not true today. So that, you know, the mm -hmm. internet is no longer like a secret weapon, right? It's, it's now yeah. available to everyone. So your early mover advantage is gone. And to kind of bring that back to, you know, that, that consumer regret thing, it was interesting because I read the study and I see it happen all the time, is people do more searches now post-purchase than ever before. Because yeah. they might buy something, like they might see something on TikTok or they see something, they're like, oh, that's cool, I want to get it. But then they want to kind of, make sure that, did I make a good choice, right? Like, was this a good purchase? Was this a smart decision? The, that validation is so important. And I think brands sometimes forget this, is that your your process, your marketing doesn't just stop at point of sale, point of purchase. Yeah. You need to carry that through post-purchase to say, can we validate this customer feeling good about doing business? Yeah, this is all awesome stuff. And um, it is my dream for you, Shama, that you get to speak more at uh, what we now call B2B go-to-market conferences. They are starting to spring up nowadays because you have a much wider scope, really, as to how uh, these things should work from an integrated perspective. And when I say go-to-market, it's usually for all sides, but mostly for now it's popular in the, in the B2B world. So, uh, for example, in your LinkedIn profile, I would imagine one day a GTM hashtag. You add in a GTM hashtag in there so that people can really know what a jewel you are in terms of some of these things that you've mentioned, uh, which is very holistic. And my challenge with the GTM scope, B2B in general, is that people are not very holistic. Now, you've mentioned a lot of lessons from the B2B space on how we can nurture customer relations, um, do you think there are some of the other things that other B2B marketers or, again, B2B demand gen marketers should be looking at or considering when it comes to marketing in general? Like you said, not PR is just one aspect of marketing. Ads is just one aspect of marketing. But what are some of the things you've learned in your 16 years of experience in the B2B space that could help nurture customer relationships or customer relations to get the desired um, outcome? You've mentioned a lot. I will not lie. But <laughs> I don't know if there's still anything else that you've got. Well, I, I really appreciate that, Dots. And thank you for that insight and perspective. One of the things that's been really interesting about my career is I, I, you know, I do a lot of keynote speaking and I am a keynote speaker and I've done it for, again, just as long as I've been in business, like 16 years and I've spoken in over 24 countries. I can't say that wow. I've spoken at a lot of B2B conferences, funnily enough, but yeah, maybe someone will listen and be like, Hey, got some interesting ideas, some, some contrarian takes here. So I look, I, I love, you know, I think B2B is marketing is very new because companies are you know they take so much pride in being sales-led organizations and they're like what a bunch of fooey because <laughs> your customers they, and that's not to say sales isn't important i mean look i'm anyone who knows me will tell you that i love sales i think sales are is the lifeblood of a business so it's yeah. more to say that your buyers sales is not the first step right so i mean you don't have to look far to see studies to, to, that show you you know someone's through the buying process 60 to 90 percent depending on the study you look at before they even talk to sales so if you're still a sales-led company what does that say about you because for most b2b companies 
marketing is like an on-demand collateral factory. ACL needs the one sheet, you know. We need a yeah. we need it. it's the other way, yeah. but really it's it should be the first touch point you're you're mar- you're going through to to marketing. So I, I think there that's you know, when you come to demand gen and so forth, so much of it you know, and it can also tell when companies are uh, founder led, like CEO led versus customer led. And what I mean by that is sometimes you see these activities and you're like, this is like as an outsider can look at it and be like, this is mm-hmm. a terrible yeah. idea. Like why are they doing this world? And you realize it's not because they're listening to the customers, it's because the leadership or the CEO is like, I like marketing and this is what we're going to do. And then you see organizations that are really plugged into the customer where the CEO can sort of take their ego out of it. I'm not even saying CMOs because I think they generally are customer led to most degree. Now, some of them might overly rely on performance because that's the world they come from. And so yeah. there's one piece of advice I would say is I rarely see CMOs who come from brand who are looking at performance majority of people I run into come from performance that don't have an understanding of brand, but even that whole exactly. thing is so broken because it says brand stop a funnel and performance is not a funnel, but people don't even buy the funnel anymore. You know, we've done, we've, we have a lot of stuff on our blog. You can look this out, but it, they talk about the messy middle. People buy in the mm. middle and it's messy and it's not yeah. this kind of brand serves top of funnel. So one of the, the misconceptions that I like to break down for people is, this is PR or in media, all of these things. These are not top of funnel activities. These are well, you're buying top, top down. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the fascinating things. And so this messy middle, you know, Google did all this research, spent millions of dollars and they, they do, they spend so much money looking at this um, in their R and D and trying to figure out how customers buy. And so one of the things that's so fascinating is when you look at this chart, this messy middle, you see that the, the driving factor at the end of the day, like what makes that decision, the customer go one way or the other is exposure. Like literally yeah. what they're saying is repetition drives revenue. So the more they see your brand, the more likely they're to do business with you. Why? Because the more they see it, the more they trust it, the more they trust it, the more likely they're, they are to buy it. Now, not all of those touch points are going to be paid. I mean, it's, <laughs> Some of them, sure. Like, I think paid is an important part of any yeah. company's, right? Overall, sure. But I don't think you should ignore the other stuff, which is your owned, right? your owned content, yeah, yeah. your earned. Your yeah, rent. and which is your specialty. And and rented, right? Rented channels. I call this rope, mm. and I haven't, this is the first time I'm even talking about it publicly I, um, <laughs> because we've been working on this internally, but I call it the rope model. I call it, you know, it's your rented channels. It's your own channels, it's paid, and it's earned. And then the miasma is, of course, like, I don't really call it, I don't really say social channels because everything is social. Man, like, yeah, yeah, our yeah, lives yeah. are yeah. social. So, yes, you can yeah. talk about the platforms which come and go, but, you know, social and how we communicate and how we share privately, which is dark social, that's that's the miasma around all of this. So, anyway, so, that, so I think when you look at just paid, it's one one slice, an important slice. But then you need all the you need all the spokes in the wheel to actually run. Yeah. So you heard it first, guys. The rope strategy from from Sharma on this podcast, the marketing leadership podcast. And um, with everything you keep saying, like you know, you you keep you know uh, hitting the nail on the head in terms of you know how demand gen should really look like holistically. And I agree with you. Brand has its own funnel. I think brand should have its own flywheel. Performance should have its own flywheel as well. It's not what we used to have before when it starts with brand and ends with performance. No, I think they should have their own different um, uh, flywheel, if I'll put it that way. So that's really great. Now let's uh, talk about uh, tactics. And I will try to go through that uh, uh, quickly here. I believe that you agree with me that from a creative marketing perspective, um, it's more profitable to make customers the hero of the brand story or the media boss. Is that something you agree with? Sure. Yeah. I think the yeah. customer should be at the heart of everything that you do. Yeah. And you also released a very new tool, um, you know, um, that helps people to craft better PR messaging. And the way I even see it, like I had commented, you know, when you launched, um, you may want to extend it to other media uh, types as well and have like, like, an, like an integrated uh, approach to it. Do you want to tell us how the uh, the impact of AI 
you know, in developing that tool and, you know, AI in driving, uh, again, customer relations, the new PR um, today. Uh, how, how is AI affecting everything, including your interaction with customers and even the impact with your, your, your PR tool? Sorry, um, uh, you can mention the name of the tool as well. It just escaped my mind now. Yeah, the, the, the tool is called snoozernews.com. Mm-hmm. And it came about for a couple of reasons, right? So generally, when you look at most press releases, they're incredibly boring. And it's a very old school way of putting out a message. And so the team had this idea of let's create a fun tool. And it really is meant to be a fun tool. You can put your press release in there. And it does a couple of things. And I haven't seen any tools like this out there because... Yes, can it edit it for you? Absolutely. But that's not the sweet spot. I think the interesting thing is there's like a snoozometer, right? So it tells you like, mm-hmm. is this news? Is this media worthy? Um, and it looks at like novelty and clarity. And is this interesting? And you know, my goal was kind of, because we had people who came to us and they said, look, I know this is a really boring press release, but my boss thinks it's important. So now it's like, go put it yeah. in this tool and you have someone to back you up to say whether it's a snooze or... You know, and if it is, then how do you change that? The other nice thing about this tool is it tells you what channels might be good for this. You know, everyone, whenever they have news, they always think, oh, this should be like, the media should love this. And and the truth is, tier one media is difficult for most news, unless it's a really, like, it fits something that's happening, there's something major that connects to, it's just not going to be that that major of a, of a hit. And so when you put it in, it tells you, like, listen, this might not be a big tier one piece, but your industry may really care about it. Trade publications may care about it. Podcasts would be a good fit. So really that's that's kind of, you know, our, our thought process behind this tool. The, the team trained it. So it's built on generative AI. It's built on chat GPT. But then we added our layer, meaning the Zen Media team, you know, our yeah. ER senior strategist specialist, we looked at copious amounts of press releases, not just our, just press releases, and edited the heck out of them to say, what would we do differently if this was our client? How would that need to look? And so it's trained on that, on what makes a good press release. Um, and, you know, the, the thing that's very important to me, Dots, and I think that's the part of like our secret sauce, is that we always walk the talk. Like, we were in social media before it was a thing. And so yeah, with yeah. the eye... I see some forms like, let's put another white paper out. Boring. I, I, I don't want to just talk about things. I want to immerse myself in it. I actually want to do them to say, you know what? People can talk about AI. We actually want to do it. You want to play with it. Is it perfect? Is it? No, but who cares? I think this is the same kind of argument you got when social was out there. Well, what about this? Yeah. What about that? Right? And so, yes, there's some element that requires structure, but I think we're for the most part, <laughs> being able to actually immerse yourself, try things, you know, nothing's going to be a fit, 100% fit, perfect for everyone, but you take from it what makes sense for you. So even now with clients, we're using AI in so much of our, of our work and we'll, in how we help them create more efficiencies, how we're running things. Uh, there's, there's just so many amazing tools out there. And so I guess for me, it was also like, hey, look, we're embracing technology for the first comms firm that I know, right? Marketing comms firm to put anything like this mm-hmm. out there. Now there are editors, but that's just chat GPT in a different drag. It's like editing. Yeah. But this has actually been trained by us and gives you a lot more in-depth understanding of kind of, you know, is this interesting? And I think yeah. that kind of, you know, is this interesting is really the question that I was very excited to try and, and answer with the help of the ad. Yeah. I, I was going to make that clarification, but yeah, you just said that there. It's just, it's beyond... A, edit this copy. It's it's you know building ChatGPT as a PR human, and then making that work for millions of users across the world for new projects. So that that makes a lot of sense. Um, a very un undiscussed topic is the traditional or alternate media. You had mentioned the dark channels. It's not really dark social now. Search is also going to become dark. <laughs> um, but do you want to tell us how you run? You know traditional media campaigns for B two B, which would be is a very, which would be a very interesting uh, way. How do you do that? How do you do that and you know add that to digital just to make sure that the brand is easily uh, noticed? Um, would you want to share your unique perspective to that? 
Yeah, so it's very interesting that you see traditional because I'm like, what is traditional versus digital now, right? And so again, I yeah. feel like these are differences that marketers, we've created over time and we have to because we're trying to make sense of, <laughs> so even now you have traditional departments and digital departments, but again, this is done, for, and same thing with brand and performance. These kind of divisions, marketing PR, they're created for the industry to help make it easier for us. But they do not put the buyer. At the, do you think the buyer gives a fig? Hey, damn, yeah, yeah. He whether I, whether you saw a billboard or you saw a social media post, yeah. When you engage with a brand, do you think I am now engaging with this brand in the physical world? I am now engaging with this brand in the digital world. You don't think about it this way. Why would your customers? And so I think when you say traditional, you're alluding to dots, right? Like trade shows and like the offline, the physical, but. And so, yes, look, we help our clients with those things. You know, CES is a huge show for us every year because we have so many clients do go to market and launch. And, yeah. and we've yeah. a big kind of launch path with you to help them get to that level. And we had so much fun last year. So, yes, and it's not where the story stops. When you think about, again, how is the buyer, the, the heart of it, what, how are they, how are they engaging? What remote, what does that look like? And so I think that's the thing that kind of gets, you know, a little. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I get what you mean. Right. Which but that's where it needs to start. So I think these distinctions of brand and performance and digital and physical and, you know. Um, you know it's, uh, we, are, we are living in a multi-moment world is what you're saying. Yeah. I used to be, if you start with the customer, study your customer, think about how they engage. See, even like, you know, like a term like dark social, not a new term, by the way, you know, and Atlantic journalists yeah, yeah, find it yeah. and, to 2014 talked about this for yeah. a long long time but i think now you see it kind of come to fruition and all that means is people consume publicly but they share privately because as they're listening to these dots do you know how few people are going to leave comments or message you or message me and say oh this was a good podcast very few and if you give up or yeah. I, and you're like oh well the podcast doesn't work of course it doesn't yeah. but what yeah. what's much more likely is someone listening to this is going to take that link and share it with their team in slack and say, you guys should listen to this. They're going to email someone and say, hey, have you heard of this? They're going to, this is how I get booked at conferences all the time. I don't know these, I don't know them, right? Until I meet them. Yeah. I, I spoke yeah. in Bali last year, lovely group of, of marketers. And this beautiful young lady came up to me and she said, you know, I've been watching your videos and I put you forth to the committee. And I mean, she essentially was, was an ambassador for me. She was so sweet. She advocated for me. I didn't know her, right? So all of this happens. That is dark social. So when you put yeah. content out there, I think that's really interesting. You know, consumption is engagement. Like at some yeah. point, we've been yeah. told these vanity metrics are bad. Why? Why are they so bad? Right? They shouldn't be your business outcomes. That makes sense. But these metrics also matter. Most people do not comment publicly. They do not engage publicly. It, it, yeah. So I think that's the thing you've got to realize is, we want people to act a certain way, but we don't act that way. And so I think yeah. for brands, it's very important to say, how do people actually act? And that requires spending time with your customers and not doing things the way you've always done them and being able to check your assumptions and not just focusing on the merely measurable. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, um, you, you know how customers act, which is why we are talking about customer relations. We have one more question, and then I will have a 30-second uh, rapid fire. It's called the dots rapid fire. So let me go to the question first. How do you track virality? Um, like I said at the beginning, your website, you had like, a, I don't know, very high, I think 80, 85% viral rates. How, how do you do that? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. The virality is interesting. One, I don't think it's something to be, I don't think it's a worthy goal. Let me put it that way, right? I think. Oh, okay. It's really, it's really not because look, if I can go viral tomorrow, it doesn't mean it's going to be meaningful. It's you, right. You could do something funny and silly, and sure, it could go viral, but is that really what you want? So I think when yeah. I say virality, when we use it, when we use that term, we look at getting in front of your audience that you care about and moving the needle in a way that makes sense. Look, our clients are not, you know, Coca Cola, for example, right? They're they have a very specific audience they're going after. For them, virality is not, hey, we want to be, you know, on the yeah, all over the place. Where, yeah, 
virality is yeah. we are now top dog in our industry. The campaign was a big hit. The study that we produced, whatever. That's that's true virality. So I think if you want to define it that way, I'm I'm all for it. Oh, I, I that's a great perspective. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, relevance is better than virality. Is what I hear you saying there. So so that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the thirty second uh, uh, rapid fire. What is your favorite uh, campaign? Your best campaign ever? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have a favorite. And be really honest, I think there's something I love about every campaign. My most favorite thing about every campaign is is honestly the the brainstorming with with our team because they just they're fun. We have such a good time as we're coming up with these ideas. Um, it that's really what lights me up. Yeah, that is a very good way to answer that question. <laughs> How long do you use social media every day? Truth uh, and nothing but the truth. Yeah, I do. I don't think I use social media, you know, in that sense that I don't spend a lot of time scrolling. I don't spend, I am very strategic in how I use it, meaning I'm looking for trends. I'm, I have a lens. I'm looking for what makes sense for our clients. What do I need to flag for our team? What's happening in the news that we want to make sure that our clients are connected into. So it's very different than I think an average consumer's use. For me, it's very much a tool and a lens with, and to, and to that degree, a ton, right? All, all day. I don't, I don't know if I'm or disconnected really because it's, it's my job. Yeah, yeah, it's part of your job. That makes a lot of sense. Last question. What is your favorite marketing quote? Uh, you know, I, I'll just kind of highlight the one we talked about here, which is choose the meaningful over the merely measurable. Hmm. Meaningful over the merely measurable. And on that note, Shama, I want to thank you for this. Thank you so much for your time. I promised that I was going to cut this to be very short and concise, but um, I just can't contain my excitement. So forgive me for that. I know for those who don't already know you, millions know you already, but for those already who don't know you, where can they find you? Uh, thanks, Dad. So this was fun to do. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's probably where I hang out the most, but also Instagram, X, Facebook, pick your poison. And of course, you can find us on benmedia.com. Absolutely. So guys, uh, that's all we have for today. Don't forget to check my, my website, Dots Loves Marketing, for all other episodes like this one. Marketing Leadership, you can find it on all the podcast platforms of your choice, Spotify and co. Until next time, connect the dots. Thank you for listening to the Marketing Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Dots Loves Marketing. There will be links to any resources mentioned in today's show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.